Amazon has really been a game changer in the reverse logistics world because of how easy their returns are. From all those returns, there's now nearly 6 billion pounds of landfill waste generated a year and 16 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. That's the equivalent of waste produced by 3.3 million Americans in a year. The reason the circular economy exists is to make sure these items find a home and keep it out of the landfill system. I have 113 stops today. Um, so I'm gonna start with this one, then I go up, then down, up, down, up, down, up, down. The idea that a driver feels like he or she can't eat lunch or go to the bathroom is a problem. I've been tired, exhausted, long days. People are hitting folks in crosswalks. They are hurting their own bodies because they're so afraid of losing their jobs because they have to get these routes done. What's going on? It's your girl, Selena Queen, coming to you guys with the video of the day in the life of an Amazon delivery driver. I have 113 stops today. Um, so I'm gonna start with this one, then I go up, then down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Delivering packages for the world's largest e-commerce company is a monumental job, especially with this month's annual Prime Day sales event. I've been tired, exhausted, long days. Shaleen Williams and 115,000 other drivers are part of Amazon's solution to the most expensive part of a package's journey, getting it that last mile to customer doorsteps. This is where I used to load out, 210 right there. We spoke with current drivers and took a ride with former driver Adrian Williams to see where she delivered for Amazon from November 2019 to July 2020. I would average between like 150, 180, sometimes 190 packages. Since 2018, Amazon has been building out its network of these independent contractors, Delivery Service Partners, or DSPs. With more than 2,000 of them across the U.S. now, DSPs helped Amazon reach notoriety for extremely fast shipping. There's a lot of aspects of the job that are really enjoyable. You get a lot of exercise, the customers are really happy to see you, they're getting whatever the heck they ordered, but there's things that need to be fixed. From urinating in bottles to running stop signs, routes that lead drivers to run across traffic, dog bites, and cameras recording inside vans at all times, DSP drivers have voiced big concerns, largely tied to the relentless workload required to meet Amazon's one-day shipping promise. The expectation is just go, 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 go at your own cost. Historically, Amazon relied heavily on UPS, the Postal Service, and to a lesser degree, FedEx, for the heavy lift of last mile delivery. It was 2013. They had a holiday season. It was a fiasco in terms of late and missed deliveries. A lot of it had to do with weather. A lot of it had to do with Amazon dumping massive amounts of volume at the last minute on UPS and to a lesser extent FedEx. But it was at that point that Jeff Bezos said, we can't entrust this business entirely to other people. So Amazon built an in-house network called Amazon Logistics. It's grown to include everything from semi-trucks to Amazon airplanes, individual flex drivers, and since 2018, fleets of vans run by delivery service partners, or DSPs. Amazon pretty much has control over the operation. It's Amazon's vans, it's Amazon's insurance, they're providing it at a discount. Amazon wants entrepreneurs. They need drivers. They want to control as much of the delivery process as they can. These small contractors allow Amazon to oversee deliveries in regions all over the country without directly hiring any employees. Amazon fights tooth and nail to maintain the status quo that these are contractors, they're not employees, because if they are employees, then you've got to pay them benefits, you've got to pick up their expenses for uniforms, trucks, what have you. And then Amazon's cost structure changes. And if Amazon's cost structure changes, uh, so will yours. They have uh, built up their operation uh, very, very quickly, largely because uh, they were able to build a last mile network using uh, third party DSPs uh, instead of having to go out and hire all these people and put them uh, on the books themselves. 
Amazon Logistics also allowed Amazon to avoid paying outside carriers for the majority of shipping. Amazon now delivers nearly two-thirds of its own packages through its logistics programs like DSP. We uh, estimate that Amazon roughly spends uh, in a $350 to $4 a box uh, to deliver. This compares to UPS and FedEx's average revenue per unit at about $10 to $12. So we think it can be a meaningful savings to Amazon to do this themselves. Control over its own deliveries allowed Amazon to make one-day shipping the norm in 2019. Although the pandemic caused significant shipping delays, the number of Prime members recently reached 200 million. Since the early days of Amazon Logistics, bigger independent logistics companies have also been under contract to deliver for Amazon. But in 2018, Amazon went after a wider regional reach by launching the DSP program, with special deals for small businesses with fleets of 20 to 40 vans and 25 to 100 employees. To get the program off the ground, Amazon purchased 20,000 dark blue Mercedes Sprinter vans to start, leasing them to DSPs at a discount. It offered $10,000 grants to existing Amazon employees, Black, Latinx, and Native American entrepreneurs, and military veterans trying to launch a DSP. The DSP model is separate from Amazon Flex, an even smaller business model in which independent gig workers make between $18 and $25 an hour driving individual routes on demand. Unlike Flex drivers, DSPs have Amazon-provided discounts on things like fuel, insurance, uniforms, and electronic package scanners, known as rabbits. The DSP is responsible for almost everything else, from maintaining the vehicles to hiring drivers and providing pay, benefits, and overtime. It's cheaper. It gives them more flexibility. They don't have work rules to abide by. If you, the contractor, want to provide benefits to your drivers, go ahead. Amazon will not do that. Amazon offers terrific deals to people. One of the reasons they're able to do that is they don't have the cost structure that a UPS has. From washing vans to replacing vans to paying for workers that get hurt, they can put it on a DSP owner and they don't have to pay for it. While UPS, FedEx, and the Postal Service directly employ drivers, Amazon's contractor model isn't unique. While Amazon has about 2,000 DSPs, FedEx Ground has around 7,500 of what it calls independent service providers. What Amazon's doing is a little bit different uh, in that they're using uh, DSPs uh, that are also kind of professional delivery companies, but maybe a little more mom and pop and a little smaller in nature. The DSP is responsible for recruiting and hiring drivers. Fast paced, you're not really dealing with anybody. You're doing it by yourself with the occasional manager, boss calling you, telling you something that you have to do. I mean, I guess I'll say Amazon's the best job I've ever had so far. Drivers pick up their vehicles at a designated lot or Amazon warehouse, then line up and drive in to load up with boxes organized into color-coded bags. All my bags are over here. And then I have my oversized over here, mainly on the shelves, and I got some on the floor. Each package is labeled with yellow stickers that assign them a chronological order for drop-off. I normally always sort my first bag while I'm just waiting. And that helps me, like, when I get to my first couple of stops, everything's already sorted, so I don't have to go through and resort everything and take more time when I'm actually on the clock. Some DSPs also have the bigger walk-in style delivery trucks like those used by UPS. Jackie Nash drives one of those for a DSP in Richmond, California. She wasn't comfortable appearing on camera. It's so much bigger, there's more room, you can spread your package out. In the van, you have to stack the package, it's, it's, it's way harder. DSPs also lease unmarked white vans for their drivers, although these don't have shelves. Anytime you stop, anytime you turn, all your packages will just fall all over the place on the ground and then you're done. And then you're just rummaging through things and then that also lends to the problem of slowing you down. Amazon sets the routes and delivery loads of up to 400 packages per driver per day using the Flex app. I have left 111 packages. So if I click on this map, you can kind of see my route for today. Amazon estimates it costs as little as $10,000 to start a DSP. Amazon pays the DSP per route and says annual profits can range from $75,000 to $300,000. But the DSP business can be a tough one. Amazon is not about making money for anyone but Amazon. It's very hard for a contractor to generate a lot of profit based on what Amazon is charging per parcel. And also the workload is 
very, very intense, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day, a lot of stops, a lot of deliveries. CNBC reached out to several DSP owners, although none would talk on the record. Despite requests, Amazon also did not provide interviews with DSP owners or drivers. During the pandemic, Amazon sales have smashed earnings expectations, and it's hired more than 400,000 people. But DSPs didn't always share in the success. Some turned to federal aid to make it through, receiving at least a million dollars from the Paycheck Protection Program. But the pandemic was certainly a popular time for drivers to join the program, like Shalene Williams, who started driving in April last year. So I just debriefed from my route today, and Amazon has some snacks up for us. One October 2020 survey of 1,500 delivery drivers found that 63% joined in the last six months. According to Indeed.com, Amazon driver pay averages around $18 an hour, about $1.50 above the national average. Shalene Williams makes $15 an hour. Adrian Williams made $20 an hour. Jackie Nash makes $20.25 an hour. Nash is trying to get a job at UPS. <laughs> they pay way more. <laughs> they top out at $38. <laughs> they got raises every six months. They do not slave you with all these packages. And they're a union. Who does not want to work for a union? And their benefits are excellent. UPS drivers belong to the Teamsters. Meanwhile, union presence at FedEx is minimal. Because DSPs are contractors, it's hard for them and their drivers to unionize. You will never have Amazon approach the same model as UPS does because Amazon would have to price prime at like 250 per person not being subject to union work rules, union wages, gives them a lot of flexibility to pivot on a dime, and they do. The arm's length relationship also gives Amazon the power to sever the contract with a DSP or a driver at any time. This provides Amazon some insulation from the inevitable risks of the shipping industry, like botched deliveries, accidents, and even deaths. In 2016, an Amazon driver struck and killed an 84-year-old grandmother in Chicago. Her family brought a lawsuit against Amazon and the contractor, alleging that Amazon put excessive pressure on drivers to deliver on time. Two more deaths occurred in 2018. The little corners that you cut are very dangerous for both you and the community around you. People are busting their ass driving way over the speed limit. People are running through stop signs, running through yellow lights. Everybody I knew was buckling their seatbelt behind their backs because the time it took just to buckle your seatbelt, unbuckle your seatbelt every time was enough time to get you behind schedule. A 2019 ProPublica report found Amazon's contract drivers were involved in more than 60 serious crashes since 2015, at least 10 of which were fatal. In court, Amazon has repeatedly said it's not responsible for the actions of its contractors. Delivery is also an inherently dangerous business for drivers from any company. Of the 5,333 occupational deaths in the U.S. in 2019, more than 1,000 of them were drivers. According to one report by a labor union coalition that analyzed data from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Amazon DSP workers experienced severe, lost time injuries at nearly three times the UPS rate in 2020. Amazon holds mandatory safety meetings for all warehouse employees before each shift. But outsourcing driving to DSPs takes away Amazon's ability to control these kinds of day-to-day -day operations. Instead, it relies on technology. Amazon tracks safety metrics with its Mentor app, which scores drivers on behavior like speed, braking, and use of mobile devices. It uses collective driver scores to rank a DSP from poor to fantastic plus, offering bonuses for high-scoring DSPs. It was more of an emotional drain, uh, like a mental drain because you were always afraid of like, what was my mentor score gonna say for the next day? Did I get caught doing something wrong? Did something get scanned incorrectly? If you can see right here, mine is at four or something, and they said my driving on Thursday was risky. AI-enabled cameras in some vans have four lenses to watch the road, both sides of the vehicle, and the driver. An Amazon instructional video says it's recording 100% of the time. I just don't feel like I should be watched eight to 10 hours out of the day. They say it's for safety, which I can kind of see. Like if we were to get into an accident, they want to see what we were doing inside the van. But uh, it just seems like it's more so to kind of make sure we weren't in the wrong. They could try to pin it on us. 
The camera's AI software can activate audio alerts if it detects one of 16 different safety issues, such as failing to stop at a stop sign, wear a seatbelt, or pay attention to the road. Distracted driving. If I make a hard turn or something, or try to grab a phone or something, like you can hear them say, distraction. Some drivers told us the cameras do provide a sense of safety under certain circumstances, like around aggressive dogs or customers. The camera that's facing out that can see the road, I feel that's a good part of the camera because if you pull up to a customer's house, you know, if there is an altercation, if the altercation is on the camera feed, you know, they can go back, review the camera, and then take action that way. Shalene Williams has been bitten by dogs on her routes. Once, she had to go to urgent care, but waited until after she delivered all her Amazon packages. The first leg it bit, it didn't break skin or anything. But the second time the dog bit me, it definitely broke skin. I made sure to tell the uh, homeowner and everything, and then I had to go to urgent care after my shift. I wasn't gonna cause one of my colleagues to have to come save me. Um, so yeah, I finished my route and then went, went after. In a statement, Amazon told CNBC, safety is our top priority, which is why we've been investing in driver safety for years, including industry-leading camera-based technology in our vehicles that reduces accidents by 48%. We also use sophisticated technology that plans drivers' routes, and in fact, more than 90% of drivers finish their routes before their scheduled time. So they've been driving out at a steady pace like this. Since 6 a.m. That's a lot of deliveries. Yep. With Prime Day this month, Amazon is likely to see record-breaking sales, and this means lots of deliveries and pressure on the DSPs and their drivers. When new people would come and they'd be like, oh, I'm doing so good, and we'd be like, slow down. Because if you deliver 120 packages today, you're gonna get 124 tomorrow, and it never ends. We can work 10 hour shifts. My heaviest day was, I had 199 stops, about 320 packages. Sometimes I would have to take all the oversized packages out just to find the one that I need. Drivers follow routes on the Flex app, which are determined by Amazon's algorithms, which also set package loads and delivery order. Some drivers say the routes have made them walk across busy highways carrying armloads of packages and that the GPS has issues. The route had me backtracking today a lot in the beginning, so I kind of got behind schedule. But ain't nothing I'm still going to finish before my 10-hour shift is over. I've had days where the GPS was horrible the whole time because their GPS doesn't work in places like Vacaville. Locked there. Locked. Can't get in. Can't get in. Gate. Day. I've had days where the stops were so close together and it was triple digits outside and so my AC could never heat up and I got heat stroke and had to get taken off my route by the ambulance. I'm getting the out of here. Some of that stuff can really be mitigated by just having a route designer that says if we're gonna put these people in the worst crime-filled neighborhoods, maybe we should let them be there in the daytime instead of 10 p.m. in November. Because it's Christmas time and that's when Amazon workers are more apt to get carjacked. Thank you so much for giving me this in the daytime because I would have literally thought I was getting killed tonight. In other instances, drivers have reported they don't have time to find a bathroom. There were times where I didn't drink anything all day, I didn't eat anything all day because that might cause you to go to the bathroom. When you have to leave your route to go use the bathroom, by the time you're back at your route, that's like a whole 30, 45 minutes that you're taking away because you're driving 14 minutes or eight minutes to go try to find a bathroom. And then that stops your whole flow of delivering your packages. Now that's why some people are urinating in cups and plastic bottles. The only thing with that though is they don't necessarily throw them out of the vans or throw them in the trash or pour them out. They just kind of leave them, which is definitely disgusting, you know, getting into the vans the next day and seeing somebody's pee bottle and, uh, sitting behind the seat or sitting in the cup holders. Some of my coworkers have also found people had urinated in hand sanitizer bottles. So you can only imagine what it would feel like if you went to use the hand sanitizer and found out that it was pee. That was a talk at our stand-up meetings almost every single day. Like, empty your vans at the end of your shift. Nobody wants to empty your pee bottles. 
the conversation was never don't pee in bottles. That was never the conversation. The conversation was throw them away. CNBC went to one gas station near an Amazon warehouse in the Bay Area, where the manager says drivers throw pee bottles away after their shifts. She didn't want to give her last name or appear on camera in the interest of protecting her job. My gas station attendants were complaining about the urine bottles in the trash constantly. It was a lot of dripping. It smelled really bad in the dumpster area. It was leaking all over the freaking parking lot and everything because it was always liquid in the garbage cans. Should Amazon be doing something differently? Yes, maybe they can provide porter potties around the cities for them because I think AC Transit does that also in areas they know there's trouble using the restroom. Amazon initially denied that workers urinate in bottles, but later apologized. It admitted that drivers do have trouble finding bathrooms, but said it's an industry-wide issue and is not specific to Amazon. With Amazon, you have a different route every day. One day you might be in a place where a bathroom is plentiful, and the next day you may be in the middle of nowhere. And that's where I think it's different from like FedEx and UPS, because at least those people can plan their day. There's no way to have any control over your day with Amazon. I'm holding my pee for like two hours because I'm in the boondocks and there's nowhere to go. Amazon reserves the right to deactivate drivers for things like public urination and abandoning customers' packages in outside unsecured locations. Williams decided to quit after a particularly bad day last July. I had like the day from hell and I just lost it. I had gotten like charged by somebody's pit bull and then I got locked in somebody's gated community. It was only for like five minutes, but when you're on this strict time crunch and that's when my co-workers was like, hey, did you hear that three drivers got sick and they told our boss not to tell anybody? And I was just like, I quit. A new feature of the Flex app pings drivers when they're supposed to take breaks and reroutes them back to the warehouse if a driver has been logged on for too many hours. I wouldn't say it's kind of any riskier or any worse or any any more of a challenge than um, honestly, uh, you know, a any other form of delivery. Amazon is also working to make its vehicles safer. It ordered 100,000 electric delivery vans from Rivian Automotive that are all scheduled to be on the roads by 2030. Features include exterior cameras that give the driver a 360-degree view, strengthened driver's side door, larger floor space for moving around packages in the back of the van, and wraparound taillights for better brake detection. I think Amazon owes it to the contractors and the drivers to make sure that the driver is operating safely, and that includes not forcing the driver to make 25 stops in a specific time frame that compels the driver to take risks behind the wheel. Adrian Williams suggests that an Amazon employee be physically present in each region, who is in charge of listening to driver feedback and improving routes. Here's the destination on my left, across this water. Maybe it's too big of an ask to say, put a route designer in every warehouse, but break that down regionally because you're really putting drivers in dangerous situations by having route designers only in Seattle who don't understand the areas they're putting drivers in. And they're putting drivers in really, really dangerous situations. Drivers need people to talk to, to go back and say like, hey, this didn't work. You drove me into a lake. It'd be nice to not drive into this lake next time. An Amazon spokesperson told CNBC it's working on addressing gaps in its routing system and improving capacity planning, hoping to give drivers fewer stops. They have to ease up on their time. Stuff happens on the road, and it's not always the driver's fault. But the idea that a driver feels like he can't eat lunch or go to the bathroom, he or she, is a problem. People are hitting folks in crosswalks. They are hurting their own bodies because they're so afraid of losing their jobs because they have to get these routes done. So either hire more drivers or just say maybe things won't get delivered in two days. Sending back an online order has never been easier. It's often free for the customer. Refunds can be instant. You can drop off Amazon items at Kohl's, UPS, or Whole Foods without boxing it up or even printing a label. Sometimes Amazon even tells you to keep it. But the truth is there's no such thing as a free return. Somebody has to pay for that. And it's falling back on either Amazon 
or the third party seller. It comes out of their bottom line and inevitably makes prices go higher. In 2021, $761 billion worth of merchandise was returned, and more than 10% of those returns were fraudulent. And sellers told us they simply end up throwing away about a third of returns. From all those returns, there's now nearly 6 billion pounds of landfill waste generated a year and 16 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. That's the equivalent of waste produced by 3.3 million Americans in a year. UPS predicts a 10% increase in returns compared to last holiday season, meaning more waste and expense for all online retailers. At the head of the pack, Amazon has received mounting criticism over the destruction of millions of items. Now Amazon says it's working toward a goal of zero product disposal. It started refurbishing, reselling, and now sending pallets of returns to be auctioned off on the booming liquidation market. I thought I was getting a return box. Turns out I got a 423 pound pallet. <laughs> Coffee makers, eight and nine. Couch cover number three. Couch cover number four. As unwanted holiday gifts flood the market, we wanted to find out what really happens to e-commerce returns. Before the rise of online shopping, returns were simpler. Buy from a store, return to the store, the item is inspected and usually put back on the shelf. But returning online purchases is far more complicated and at least three times more likely, says Tobin Moore, CEO of return solution provider Optoro. E-commerce results in 25% of all goods sold being returned. Brick and mortar is about 7.5%. With online holiday sales up more than 11% over last year, returns numbers are breaking records. During the holiday shipping season from November 14th through January 22nd, UPS said it will handle 60 million returns, up from 55 million last year. It estimates that one in four Americans expect to make a return this season, and 41% expect to return three or more items. Before the pandemic in 2019, Optoro estimated 67% of consumers preferred to return online purchases in a store. By October 2020, 60% preferred shipping items back. This year, we're expecting $120 billion of returns from the holiday season, and that number was at about $100 billion pre-COVID in 2019. The convenience of e-commerce has normalized shopping habits that lead to more returns. Wardrobing, where people will order the same thing in three different sizes to see which one fits, and then they return the other two, not realizing that those other two, most of the time, don't go back on that retailer's shelves. Categories like apparel see really, really high return rates in, in the tens of percents. Um, oftentimes, we're looking at something closer to 3%. Sellers we talked to, like former Amazonian Ronick Nirmal, who now runs an Amazon aggregator with 40 plus third party brands, average a 1 to 3% return rate. Amazon wouldn't share overall marketplace returns numbers, but they're higher than Amazon anticipated. Here's an item we got, it's a garland. Micah Clausen has been selling party supplies and home decor on Amazon since 2007, now at $10 million in annual sales there. After Christmas, he got a message from Amazon that some of his unsold inventory, elf hats to be specific, would be stored in temporary on-site locations because of higher than expected volumes of customer returns. I guess it's sitting out in a trailer in their parking lot and they can't grab it easy and ship it back to us. Amazon has since resolved the storage issue for Clausen, but it also just raised its seller fees on January 18th. We were making $4 on a sale. It was a four pack, so we're making a dollar a hat. Anything I don't sell, I lose a buck fifty on just to get them back in my warehouse. So I'm not paying storage on. That gets to the point where that's going to probably wind up being a discontinued item. Amazon has a lenient returns policy for the holidays, allowing most items purchased since October 1st to be returned through the end of January. Amazon and its sellers, like Joe Stefani, also increasingly let customers keep returns. So if you buy, let's say, a $9.99 sticker, if it costs us, let's say, $3 to make it, it's obviously a lot cheaper than the 5 to $6 it would cost to get the item back officially to us. The return process can cost up to 66% of the item's original price. And as the supply chain crunch boosts the price of transport and manpower too, that cost of returns is up more than 6% from last holiday season. Last year, we estimated it cost us between $75,000 and $100,000 in returns. So you're talking about some serious money. 
And then there's bad actors who take advantage of the increasingly no questions asked returns process, something America Martinez has seen during her return center work at Amazon, where she's worked every holiday season since 2017. I had some Beats headphones. Somebody said, those are expensive. And it looks like the box was not open. But if you look closely, the factory seal had actually been opened up. And so I just opened it up. I looked inside the box and there was just a cheap set of headphones inside. It's a shower curtain. Like some of this stuff looks and smells like it was actually used and then they just went and returned it 30 days later. Oh no, those are definitely worn. What's happening more and more now is that uh, those people are being tracked and uh, you, know, you, you won't have the same returns privileges in the future. Legitimate or not, each return goes on a winding, costly reverse logistics journey, adding to carbon emissions at each node. This is true even when an item bought on Amazon is returned to a store, because there's no place on the Kohl's shelf for that item not originally sold by Kohl's. So almost all online returns get sent to a warehouse specifically designed to handle them. When it gets to our facility, it's coming off the trucks straight onto those conveyors, and we're the first people to get it and open it and see what's inside. Good night, sweetheart. Return centers, like the one where Shea Machen works, are usually older designed buildings, larger than forward logistics facilities, but with lower ceilings, because varying size pallets makes returns unsafe to stack. They're concentrated in centrally located industrial markets like Phoenix, Las Vegas, Ohio, or Tennessee. It's gonna show the actual customer's notes and everything in there saying why they didn't want this item or couldn't keep the item or whatever. You look at the item and figure out what it is. Is it the right item? Is it opened? Is it closed? Is it used? Is it damaged? You know what's going on? Machen says they have about a minute to give items an initial inspection. Then algorithms determine what happens next the computer will go through a series of questions that you have to answer about the item. It could be looking at it, it could be looking for factory seals or damages, spills, leaks, all that kind of stuff. And then dependent on what it comes up with, with those questions, the computer will determine where this item needs to go. If it's a new product, Amazon will allow that product to get resold on the listing as new, but it really needs to be in pristine condition for that to happen. And that's more rare than you would expect, even if the customer hasn't used the product at all. When it can't be sold as new, Amazon gives the seller up to four options for what can be done with a return, each with a fee. Return to seller, disposal, liquidation, or by invitation only for now, FBA grade and resell, which we'll get into later. With that first return to seller option, the return leaves the Amazon warehouse for several more legs on a truck, plane, or cargo ship. It heads back to the seller for further processing. Then it could head back to another Amazon warehouse for sorting and repacking then on to a new customer, who could always choose to return the item again. You're essentially forced to decide if you want to recall that inventory to your warehouse, which is an expensive process, repackage it yourself, and then ship it back into a warehouse to sell, which doesn't make sense, I would say, 80-90% of the time. Or you could choose to dispose it. Disposal is an all-too-common fate for returns from many of the biggest online retailers. Amazon says it sends no items to a landfill, but as a last resort, sends items to energy recovery. This means it's burned. Or in the words of the Environmental Protection Agency, the conversion of non-recyclable waste materials into usable heat, electricity, or fuel through a variety of processes, including combustion, gasification, pyrolyzation, anaerobic digestion, and landfill gas recovery. Lower value items get destroyed more often. You'll see Fashion items potentially get destroyed actually a fair amount if they're not new. And consumer electronics items, you'll see 70% of them can't go back to stock because the seal is open. The thing that really shocked me was the items that the computer system tells you to destroy. There was things that I felt like were still worthwhile. Like I had a book come back, it was a children's book, and the customer said that it was smashed upon arrival and bent, and it was not. And no matter what I put into the system, it said destroy the item. And that was kind of heart-wrenching a little bit, you know. Um, I had a couple of video games come through like that, same thing, because the factory seal was broken, even though there was nothing wrong with the item, it said to destroy it. And, uh, you know, we see it just as a cost of doing business on Amazon. Last year, Stefani says he did $8 million of sales of official branded non-apparel items like stickers, flags, and license plate holders on Amazon. We're a licensee of some of the biggest brands out there, like the NBA, the NHL, 675 colleges, universities, 
universities, musical acts like Ozzy Osbourne. How do you think the NBA, the NHL would feel if there's like Lakers stickers, you know, being liquidated? They probably wouldn't like that. <laughs> For Stefani's merchandise, disposal is often the best option. Because you just can't tell if someone took like a Chicago Bulls main logo sticker off the sheet of stickers and put it back on. So those almost always get thrown out. Sellers say the fee that Amazon charges for disposal can be a third the cost of other options. We save extra money by just doing the disposal option because they don't charge us as much to dispose an item. Disposal of returns is not just an Amazon problem. Luxury retail brands like Burberry have been criticized for burning millions in unsold merchandise to protect their brands. A Danish TV station reported H&M burned 60 tons of new and unsold clothes since 2013. Richemont, the owner of high-end jewelry brands like Cartier, admitted to destroying hundreds of millions worth of watches in two years. Similar claims have hit Urban Outfitters, Michael Kors, Victoria's Secret, and JCPenney. You know, it's the easiest thing to do. And two, sometimes certain brands do it because it, you know, they want to protect their brand and they don't want uh, lesser valued items out there on the market. One solution is to speed up the reverse logistics process. On average, we see that it can take 30 to 60 days for a retailer to receive a return, process it, figure out where it needs to go. By the time that gets back to stock, you miss the season and it's either not carried anymore or it's marked down 50%. Facing criticism for destroying merchandise, some brands have also found creative ways to upcycle returns, making them into new items of value. You know, turning their purses into yoga mats, or some of the shoes they can't sell might end up being grinded up and turned into tracks. It does take energy to grind and turn items into other items. I think first and foremost, if you can sell it in its original form, that's the, the best scenario for the environment. Indeed, Amazon says it's working toward a goal of zero product disposal. For certain electronics, like Amazon devices, phones, and video games, Amazon gives customers the option to send them to a certified recycler or trade them in for Amazon gift cards. And since 2019, Amazon's FBA donations program allows sellers to automatically offer eligible overstock and returns to charity groups through a nonprofit network called Good360. Amazon says more than 67 million items have been donated so far. Brands are embracing that selling used stuff, which used to be looked on as, as just you know, dirty, is now actually environmentally the right thing to do. And it's embraced you know, a lot by the, I'd say the younger generations are buying many more used items. But in June, British broadcaster ITV reported that Amazon was destroying millions of items at one UK warehouse, things like TVs, laptops, drones, and hair dryers. In response, Amazon added two new options for sellers meant to rehome returns rather than dispose of them. First, there's liquidation. Historically, we have taken those returns, that unsold inventory, those sorts of things from those online retailers, sold them by the truckload, to resellers. So your Craigslist, your eBay resellers, your flea market vendors. You can recover about 5% of your sale price if your product can get liquidated. And that's a great, great option because then you're not throwing it away. And at the end of the day, it will end up in someone's hands who can hopefully use it. So all this stuff is supposedly worth almost $10,000. And guess how much I paid for it? $575. A 94% savings. But let's open it. YouTube creators like Hope Allen have built a following from finding online deals. Ta-da! And liquidation pallets have become a popular trend. There were definitely some items in the pallet that it was actual trash, but then there were other items like an Ugg robe, <gasps> or like some nice heated winter gear that I'm like, really? They didn't think this was worth restocking? This is like a $300 coat, so. <laughs> Amazon and other major retailers like Target, Walmart, Costco, Best Buy, Macy's, Wayfair, and more partner with liquidation marketplaces like B-Stock, which auctions off unwanted inventory to resellers by the pallet or even truckload. For one of our clients at one time, I think we auctioned something like 42 truckloads of floor tiles in one lot. From a value standpoint, we've sold lots of cell phones that have been north of a million dollars in a single auction. It's like a fancy version of dumpster diving, but slightly more promising, safer, and more legal. <laughs> this is a good jacket though. Tag still on it, 50 bucks. Amazon also partners with liquidity services, which allows regular customers like Alan to bid on pallets of returns on liquidation.com. 
or to pick up individual items at a new direct-to-consumer all-surplus deals warehouse that opened in Phoenix in October. All of our auctions start at $5. It is single item. We have a lot of furniture, a lot of baby products, baby gates, quite a bit of electronics, and then um, outdoor and fitness, lots of bikes. The fourth and final option Amazon is trying out is an invitation-only grade and resale program for certain returns. Amazon gives the item a grade, like new, very good, good, or acceptable, then resells it on special sections of its site. There's warehouse deals for used goods, Amazon Renewed for refurbished items, Amazon Outlet for overstock, and a tongue-in-cheek daily deal site called Woot that sells a $10 bag of crap and describes itself as a wild outpost on the fringes of the Amazon community. These are a really good way of handling returns in a more sustainable way rather than destroying them or putting them in a landfill. It's definitely changed my mind as far as how much I shop. Now when I buy something and I don't like it, I usually try to figure out something else to do with it, like give it to a family member or resell it to somebody that I know would like it rather than like return, return all the time. Inside this massive warehouse in Texas, the aisles aren't lined with your typical merchandise. This would be the antithesis of your traditional e-commerce fulfillment center. This is a bundle of snowflakes where every individual box might have a different set of accessories, might be slightly different in condition quality. Every aisle is filled with returns from Amazon, Target, Sony, Home Depot, and more in the process of being liquidated. These liquidators are coming in and they're buying up all of this product in bulk. They're then packaging it, palletizing it, and reselling it. So it's turned into a much bigger portion of the industry than we've ever seen before. Liquidation used to exist on the fringes of retail. The liquidation marketplace used to be two people in a truck coming into the back of a warehouse store with cash on the barrel, trying to have special deals for special people. It was very unsavory, very unregulated. We would shake hands with people at our trade shows and you'd want to go wash your hands afterwards. It was low life buyers. And now it's been raised to a new platform by companies like Liquidity Services. We went behind the scenes at Liquidity Services to see how the only publicly traded liquidation company is helping turn the industry around. We've sold road paving equipment, entire gymnasium floors, scoreboards, postal trucks. We've sold delivery vehicles for utility companies. Retail is in the midst of a transformation. Fueled in part by the pandemic, online shopping was up more than 11% this holiday season. And with returns on average three times more likely for online purchases, a record $761 billion of merchandise was returned last year. Returns that aren't sent for liquidation are often destroyed, incinerated, or sent to landfills. The reason the circular economy exists is to make sure these items find a home and keep it out of the landfill system. Now, amid mounting pressure on retailers to do better and a supply chain backlog causing a shortage of new goods, there's a boom in the secondary market. Liquidation hasn't just gone mainstream. It's a $644 billion business. And in 2008, it was $309 billion and now it's 644 billion. So it's more than double over the last decade. This warehouse is 130,000 square feet, and we'll do between 15 and 20 truckloads of product a day through this building. We take you on an exclusive tour inside the wild, booming business of processing and reselling excess and unwanted goods on the secondary market. With slim profit margins and unpredictable quality of secondhand inventory, liquidation hasn't always been the business opportunity it is today. A lot of this used to be controlled by the mafia. It's a good way to, to hide money, honestly, because <laughs> nobody's looking at returns, especially 40 years ago, no one was looking at returns. But in 2021, more than 16.5% of all merchandise sold was returned, up more than 56% from the year before. For online purchases, the average rate of return is even higher, at 20.8%, up from 18% in 2020. Processing a return can cost retailers up to 66% of an item's original price. I would suggest that it's possible part of the inflation is these huge amount of returns that have to be sold at a loss is detracting from the profitability that a company normally has, and they have to raise their prices. 
And then there's the environmental cost. U.S. returns generate an estimated 16 million metric tons of carbon emissions and create up to 5.8 billion pounds of landfill waste each year. And retailers like Amazon, which says it doesn't send any items to a landfill, incinerate some returns as a last resort. But sustainable shopping options are a growing priority for younger shoppers. If buying one used item, it saves 82% of its carbon footprint. The boom in liquidation and is really fueled by consumers wanting to buy those items. And so it makes no sense to throw them in the garbage. They should be safely put back into circulation. What's become a huge pain point for one retail sector is big business for another. Today, there are thousands of liquidation companies. The biggest ones contract with the Amazons and targets of the world to receive returns in bulk, then sort, process, and sometimes refurbish them, then auction them off as individual items, pallets, or truckloads to other resellers or to individual consumers, like a growing segment of YouTube creators who've gained a following by unboxing returns pallets. It's like a fancy version of dumpster diving, but slightly more promising, safer, and more legal. <laughs> this is a good jacket though. Tag still on it. 50 bucks. Other resellers have side hustles on sites like eBay or Poshmark. Some of the auctions I've done, nobody else is bidding, and that's when I get really nervous that maybe this box isn't gonna be that good. And then there have been other ones where people are just going crazy and it's a full out bidding war. <laughs> so this item here, it's probably gonna go where? And auction off for what kind of price? This probably has anywhere from 10 to 15,000 of retail value, and we're gonna sell that for anywhere from three to $5,000. Bill Angrick founded Liquidity Services in 1999 with $100,000 of his savings. My father and I used to pick up used books. Fast forward to the start of eBay, we realized that a marketplace model can create value for virtually any type of used item. In 2000, Liquidity Services had its first major sale, a $200,000 marine vessel for the state of Georgia. By 2002, Liquidity Services reached profitability. By 2006, it was listed on the New York Stock Exchange, where it's seen a significant rise during the pandemic. Today, Liquidity Services handles returns for clients like Amazon, as well as the Postal Service's unclaimed mail, items left behind at TSA checkpoints, think 14 pounds of assorted knives, and out-of-service military vehicles and other gear. Seven distribution centers focusing on this circular economy challenge for e-commerce retailers with over a million square feet of space, and we've now eclipsed over 4.8 million buyers on the platform. When pallets of returns arrive at this liquidity services warehouse in Garland, Texas, just outside Dallas, the first step is to unwrap it and figure out what's inside and recycle all that packaging. This machine here is a styrofoam densifier and it takes a full pallet and a half of styrofoam and it condenses it down into this 20 pound block of melted styrofoam, which then they send out to a third party, which blows it back up into packing styrofoam again. Cardboard, we probably do about 200 tons a year of cardboard recycled, 20 tons of styrofoam a year, and about that same amount in electronics recycling. We scan an air item to come in and make sure that uh, they can put it as a manifest. Items are sorted by workers like Carlotta Barnes, who's been at the Garland Warehouse for nine years. We take it out and make sure that the product is okay to sell. When items are ready for resale, they're wrapped back up. We see we had a couple Christmas trees, we got some decorative pillows, some furniture, a desk maybe. How much is something like this probably going to auction for? So, the, so it's going to start for $100 on liquidation.com. And then the market is really going to set what, they're, what that is going to sell for. They're stacked into aisles, awaiting their turn for auction on one of Liquidity Services marketplaces. There's liquidation.com, where pallets of returns and some individual items are auctioned off to the highest bidder, secondipity for direct sale of individual items, and gov deals for those unclaimed packages, TSA items, or outdated military equipment. While Liquidity Services is one of the biggest liquidators, there are thousands of companies in the booming space. One is Goodbye Gear, which sells gently used baby and kids gear as an alternative to Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist. This space in particular really warrants a, a trusted third party because, you know, it's, it's stuff that your baby's going to sleep in or sit in and eat it. Kristen Langenfeld started Goodbye Gear after her youngest, who's now six, outgrew a particularly bulky item. It's $150 to buy it brand new, and it was amazing for the few months that she used it, and then after that, zero use for it, you know, in this big eyesore in the middle of your room. 
Another big player in the space is B-Stock, which runs branded liquidation marketplaces for huge clients like Amazon, Walmart, Home Depot, and Costco. We sold somewhere in the vicinity of 150 million individual items last year. Howard Rosenberg founded B-Stock after six years at eBay, where he saw the benefits of specializing in liquidation for others at scale. So companies typically don't want to spend a whole lot of time and effort focused on that little slice of the pie. They want to focus on the 99% slice of the pie. Liquidated returns re-enter the circular economy through individuals selling on Craigslist or eBay, pawn shops, flea markets, and thrift stores. Wanting to reuse, wanting to have less of an impact on the environment, they're also getting a good deal, right? Like we're, we're being trained not to pay full price. And if you can kind of do both things at the same time and get a good deal, I think that's what all uh, the younger generations are about. But a lot of returns can't go right back out for resale. You can see it still has plastic on it from the original manufacturer. And so we know this is a very new unit, never been used, but it was damaged during shipping. And what we can do is replace this glass with a donor glass from a unit not functioning. The refurbishment department is a big part of liquidity services business. And there's a lot of TVs here. How many are you doing every day, would you say? We do about 100 TVs a day, and they sell for anywhere from 60 to 70% of retail. My youngest has come and, you know, she's amazed by the machines and she's asked a couple of questions. Stephen Boykins relocated with three of his four kids to manage the Garland warehouse. He's been with the company six years. I try to explain it to her to where she understands and it's like, hey, when you have kids, this directly will affect you and your kids. This little piece of the operation that no one thinks about will have a vast effect over the next 50, 60 years. Gen Z shoppers, like Boykin's kids, have led a push for more sustainable retail options, boosting the overall popularity of secondhand shopping across all generations. In a survey of 1,000 consumers, 81% of baby boomers participated in resale in 2021, up from just 39% in 2019. Refurbished electronics have also gained popularity because of the shortage of new goods. When we get our refurbished product, we get really good recoveries back from it. So probably 80 to 100 percent of recoveries depending upon the seasonality in the market but right now the the market is very strong because of the supply shortages on the forward side refurbished consumer electronics like noise canceling headphones or hp laptops are in high demand but also high-end refurbished items like the machines used to make microchips we've seen fortune 500 companies access use equipment on our marketplace because the time to ship is shorter in the circular economy than originating a newly manufactured good, putting it on a vessel, transporting it across the ocean to a port that's likely backlogged for six to eight months. And as the secondary market grows, many retailers are now selling refurbished items directly. Amazon has entire sections of its site devoted to this. There's warehouse deals for used goods, Amazon Renewed for refurbished items, Amazon Outlet for overstock, and a tongue-in-cheek daily deal site called Woot that sells a $10 bag of crap. Best Buy now has an online outlet where it sells open box appliances and TVs. And HP has an outlet with refurbished computers and more. We're gonna remanufacture it and remarket it with an HP warranty, or we're going to sell it as is to a certified contracted partner who will then either remanufacture it themselves and sell it with their third party warranty or part harvest it and, and sell the parts. The liquidation boom has spawned another trend, too. Hundreds of bargain bin stores are popping up all over the country, with names like Dirt Cheap and Treasure Hunt Liquidators, where dozens of customers line up, sometimes even camping overnight to get first pick after weekly drop-offs of liquidation pallets. They dig through bins and bins of returns in search of trending items they can flip for a profit. Stores like Big Lots, Bargain Hunt, Ollie's Bargain Outlet, etc., all of these stores, and then eBay, and even Amazon has gotten into it, so they're selling the returns back to consumers because again, 90% of the time, nothing wrong with it. Liquidity Services has its own take on the direct-to-consumer trend. At the company's new all-surplus deals warehouse that opened in Phoenix in October, customers pick up items they've won in online auctions that usually start at $5. This is especially helpful for liquidating bulky items like kayaks. But something like that is gonna be very expensive to ship, no, because it's so big. That's the beauty of our fulfillment center network. We can take these items back directly from consumers and then have consumers bid online and pick up at our warehouse. 
Angrick plans to open a second All Surplus Deals warehouse in Dallas later this year. The more people discover that, hey, there's nothing inherently wrong with this product, I trust the marketplace that sold it to me, I can save significant dollars, that's really benefiting all parties.